Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with hot cross buns. That's right, I'm very excited to show you how to make this classic Easter treat. And not only are we going to save money by making these at home, I mean, what do these go for in a store these days? I'm assuming it's way more than one or two for a penny. But above and beyond being frugal, the best reason to make these is so you actually can get a real hot cross bun. Since somehow, somewhere along the line, someone decided if you just pipe a cross on a dinner roll with some icing, that would count as a hot cross bun. But it doesn't. The cross must be baked in. So stay tuned for that easy but exciting technique. But before we get to that, we have a few things to do. For example, if you're using dry currants, which you will be, I like to warm up some rum and just soak those for a few hours before I use them. Okay, totally optional step. But if you don't do this, you don't get to drink strained currant infused rum, which I have to admit was pretty good. And then once our dried fruit is prepped, we can move on to the dough, which we're gonna start with some warm milk. And by warm, I mean about 100 degrees or so, to which I'm gonna add a little bit of flour, plus one package of dry active yeast. And what we'll do is give that a mix and let it sit for about 15 minutes just to double check the yeast is good. And also we're gonna give it a little bit of a head start, growing and multiplying. So I'll let that sit for about 15 minutes. And if I see bubbles and kind of a foamy yeasty raft come to the surface, I know I'm good and we can proceed. So that is looking good right there. And then once our yeast has proved it's worthy, we can go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients, which will include some white sugar, as well as one large egg that we should beat up before adding. We will also toss in a whole bunch of lemon and orange zest, which brings us to some very traditional holiday baking spices such as freshly grated nutmeg. We will definitely also want to add some cinnamon, as well as a little bit of the mysterious and exotic cardamom. And then we're also, of course, going to need a little bit of salt. And then we'll finish this up with a little touch of melted butter, just a mere seven tablespoons. And then last but not least, we will dump in our flour. But of course, not all of it. You know we like to get this kneading first, and then we could add the rest of the flour if we need it. But anyway, whether you end up using all the flour or not, we're going to knead this for about five to six minutes until we end up with a beautiful, soft, supple, slightly elastic dough. And you know the drill here. Eventually, the dough is going to sort of ball together and pull away from the sides. And if it doesn't, that's when you add a little more flour. But eventually, it will come together and pull away from the sides, at which point we'll continue kneading until we have something that looks like this. Okay, it's going to be relatively soft and look kind of shiny. And by the way, if you use enough flour, that dough should come off the hook nice and clean. So that's looking pretty good, but let me transfer that onto our work surface so you can take a better look. And above and beyond letting you see what the proper texture should be, the other reason I transferred this onto a lightly floured surface is because we're going to flatten this out so we can press in our dried fruit. So we're going to go ahead and press that out as shown, and then scatter over our dried currants as evenly as possible. And once I had those scattered over and fairly evenly distributed, which by the way, I severely edited. This took me like 15 minutes. But anyway, once that's set, what I'm gonna do is fold it up like this. And then I gave it a turn and sort of folded it up like this before proceeding to reshape it into some kind of ball form. And then what we'll do once our currants have been successfully introduced to the dough is place that back into our mixing bowl, which has been lightly greased with oil. And what we're gonna do is cover that and let it rise for two hours or until doubled. And as you know, I just like to use my turned off oven, but any relatively warm draft free place will work. And if everything's gone according to plan, a couple hours later, your dough should look a little something like this. And if it does, what you want to do at this point is poke it with your fingers for no actual purpose, just because it's fun. And then what we'll do at this point as usual is transfer that to a lightly floured surface and we will press that down nice and flat to both deflate it and to get it into some kind of shape we can cut in equal pieces. And it was right here when I realized my method for introducing the currants into the dough may not have been as good as I thought, since it looked like they were all in one spot. So I decided to work those in a little more evenly. So I rolled it up and sort of folded it up and pressed it down, and yet they were still uneven. So I continued to fold it that way and roll it this way, and in just 10 short minutes later, I think I got them pretty well distributed. But anyway, if you don't mind, let's pretend that never happened. And keep in mind, the only reason we're flattening this out is so we can get some kind of shape we can cut into equal pieces. So I decided to divide mine into 16 equal pieces, which, by the way, I did with a digital scale once I turned the camera off. And I will share that tip on the blog post. But anyway, the point is to divide your dough evenly and then roll each of those pieces into a little ball 
using the old cup the palm over the dough and rub it against the surface using a circular motion. And by the way, don't be surprised if some of the currants pop out. You could just stick those back in or eat them. Of course, I panicked and just set mine aside, but I'll eat it later. And then what we'll do as we form our buns is transfer those onto a Silpat line baking sheet, spacing them as evenly as possible. And by the way, if you're wondering why I got 15 instead of 16, there was an incident. But anyway, we're going to cut, shape, and pan those up, at which point we're going to let those rise for 15 minutes before applying the crosses. And believe it or not, those are made with nothing more than flour and water. So what we'll do in a mixing bowl is whisk together enough cold water and all-purpose flour to make a thin but pipeable dough. And of course, I'm going to give you measurements, but you're going to probably need to adjust until you have something that looks just like this. Okay, thick enough to hold a shape, but like I just said, thin enough to pipe. Because what we're going to do after those buns have been rising for 15 minutes is pull them out, and we'll transfer our flour mixture into a piping bag or plastic bag with the tip cut off, and we'll carefully pipe across on each bun. And if you know what you're doing, you can finish the piping without using your finger. But unfortunately, I haven't really mastered that skill. Anyway, do your best. You are, after all, the Diana Ross of how to pipe your cross. Just keep in mind, they don't have to be perfect. Because as you'll see, once these bake, they look amazing. But anyway, like I said, you should be able to finish that piping without touching it. By sort of when you're done pressing in and pulling it away quickly. Which sort of worked, except I hit the one behind it. But anyway, somehow, some way, we're going to pipe across on top of each one of those buns. At which point we need to let these rise for another 15 to 20 minutes. After which these should be pretty close to doubled in size to the little dough balls we started with. So those are looking very nice if I do say so myself. And then what we'll do is let those sit right there while we preheat our oven to 425 degrees. And once up to temp, we will transfer those into the center, where we're going to bake those for about 15 minutes. During which time we have one more thing to make. The simple syrup we're going to use to brush on our finished buns. And for that, all we have to do is combine some sugar and water over medium heat and cook that until it just starts to thicken, or even better, until it reaches a temperature of 225 degrees. And what we'll do once that's set is turn off the heat and simply reserve it until needed, which is going to be pretty soon, because by now our buns should be baked. So let's go ahead and pull those out and gaze upon what may be one of the most beautiful buns of all time. I mean, come on, what's a better looking bun than that? But let's not start patting each other on the back yet. We still have things to do. What we need to do is let these cool for exactly five minutes before transferring them onto a rack, at which point we will perform the last official act, which is to glaze these with our simple syrup, or simple syrup if you prefer. So while these are still warm, we'll go ahead and glaze the tops, which I'm making look like kind of a difficult job by trying to paint these with one hand. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and brush on as much glaze as we see fit, and that's it, our hot cross buns are ready to enjoy. So for once, I'm not going to make you wait till these cool down. I mean, come on, it's right in the name. And of course, I know you're all wondering, do they taste as amazing as they look? Well, of course not. But not because they don't taste amazing, they do. Just absolutely delicious. Not too sweet, not too spicy. Not too dry, not too moist. It's just the fact that literally nothing could taste as spectacular as these look. Which reminds me, this is really more of a techniques video. And you can use this method to make hot cross buns out of any of your favorite doughs. So if there's a dough you like that you use for danishes or cinnamon rolls, or maybe even a brioche, it will work for this. But anyway, that's it. How to make real hot cross buns. I mean, if you want to just take a dinner roll and pipe across with cake frosting instead, go ahead. But you're just not going to get anything close to how amazing this is. So whether you're going to make these for Easter or not, I really do hope you give them a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.